I should like to consider with you once more the second verse in Paul's epistle to the Romans, the second verse in the first chapter, which in the authorized version is found in brackets, you remember, and in which we read, which he had promised afore by his prophets in holy scriptures. Now, last week we considered uh, that uh, statement in general, uh, looking at its component parts. We reminded ourselves that the apostle there teaches us that this good news, which he and the other apostles were proclaiming, uh, had been promised before by God himself. And uh, here he reminds us of how God had given this promise. He had given it through his servants, the prophets, his prophets. And uh, they had not only spoken this word, but they had written it in holy writings, holy scripture. And that led us on to see that here the apostle teaches uh, the typical biblical scriptural doctrine uh, concerning the scripture itself, that it is the word of God. This scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, we dealt with that last Friday evening and finished on the note that uh, this is the uh, teaching of scripture concerning itself everywhere. And that it is the teaching of our Lord himself, that you cannot read the four Gospels without discovering, as we saw in our example this evening out of that fifth chapter of John's Gospel, how our Lord did thus regard the Old Testament Scriptures as the Word of God, and how he pointed out that not only in the prophets as such, but Moses, which includes your five books of Moses, spoke of him. And that, therefore, obviously, this is a matter which should engage our serious attention. So I come back to it again this evening, as I suggested at the end last Friday evening. I'm going to try to do what I imagine the Apostle himself did when he went round preaching. You remember I indicated last Friday that it's very important for us always to remember that even these New Testament epistles do not each one of them claim to be a complete compendium of the whole of Christian doctrine. They are written to churches who had already had the preaching and the instruction. They are synopses. They remind them in, in a very condensed form of the teaching which was given in a more elaborated form and at greater length by uh, this apostle and by other apostles. You remember, for instance, that we are told that when uh, Paul was at Ephesus for about 18 months, he preached every single day. They met in the school of one Terranus, you remember. And there, uh, as I think you'll find the record tells you, if you take the trouble to look it up accurately, that from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock every day, the apostles spoke and preached and expounded the scriptures to them. Well, now, I, we shall try to give some general outline this evening of uh, the kind of thing that the apostle must have done on those occasions. Now, there are three main matters, it seems to me, that uh, immediately challenge our attention on the basis of this statement concerning the scriptures. Uh, the first does so in the most general way, and I can put it in the form of a question. The apostle tells us here that the God who had now sent his Son to do these things necessary for our salvation had promised aforetime that he was going to do so. And that raises the question, which we must ask with reverence, of course. Why did God act in this way? Why the delay? Why the long interval between the fall of men in the Garden of Eden 
and the coming of the Son of God for redemption and for salvation. Why what the author of the epistle to the Hebrews says, uh, the many parts and portions, uh, the diverse manners, and so on, why all this Old Testament history? Because we know full well that God could have done this at once and immediately. What is it that governs and controls this? There is a sense, of course, in which uh, we can only attempt to answer such a question. Finally, uh, we don't know. We don't know fully. But it is always our business to go as far as we can, helped and aided by the teaching of the Scripture itself. And therefore, I would suggest some such answers as these, because this problem has often perplexed many people. They can't understand why for so long, for so many centuries, this knowledge of God was confined to one race only, and all these other nations dwelt in darkness and in paganism. They say, what, what is the reason for that? Well, I suggest the following answers. First, that it is God's way of revealing the depth of sin. God's way of showing mankind and teaching us what sin really is. What a terrible thing it is. That it is not merely some light act of disobedience or some failure. That it really is a profound disease of the soul of men which leads to terrible and awful consequences. Now, there again, I think we've got an illustration of that in that uh, portion of Scripture which we read at the beginning out of the fifth chapter of John's Gospel. You see, the terrible thing about sin is that it blinds us to the truth of God. Our Lord's argument there on that occasion was this, you remember. These men claimed to be experts on the Old Testament. They were the teachers, the authorities on the books of Moses and so on. And our Lord says to them, go back and read them. You take your pride in Moses. You say that it's your knowledge of him and his writings that gives you salvation. Well, go and read him, because he wrote about me. But the tragedy was they couldn't see that. You remember the Apostle Paul takes up the same point in his second epistle to the Corinthians in the third chapter. He says the tragedy of the Jews is that though Moses is read to them every Sunday, they don't see the truth. Their eyes are blinded. There's a veil over their hearts. Now that's the sort of thing sin is. And with all this record of God's revelation of himself to them, they had the oracles of God. They were God's own chosen people. They were reading them Sunday by Sunday and oftener. And yet they couldn't see it because of the blindness which is the result always of sin. Well, now, all this surely does help uh, to bring that out. And you find the, this same thing, the same effect of sin in other forms. The terrible degradation uh, into which the world had sunk, as we shall be seeing when we come to the second half of this first chapter of this epistle to the Romans and so on. Part of the purpose, therefore, is to reveal that. But another reason, surely, is this. In this way, God has finally proved to mankind that any attempt on man's own part to save himself is futile and inevitably doomed to failure. You see, God gave man a full opportunity of saving himself if he could. Look at the great civilizations that rose up. Some of them are mentioned in the Bible itself. Man has made these efforts and attempts to solve his problem. He believes he can do it. His pride of intellect makes him say that. His confidence in himself in sin makes him say it. Very well. God, as it were, stood back all these long-running centuries and said, Very well, uh, give me the proof. Do the thing which you claim that you can do. So you see these great civilizations, the Babylonian, the Egyptian, Nineveh and Greece and Rome, they come up one after another, but they all fail. Now, you see, 
Mankind is face to face with this evidence. Of course, mankind still doesn't accept it. It doesn't recognize it, but the facts are there. The facts are, you see, and they're proved by this long history of the Old Testament, that in spite of all men's concentration of effort and all his ability, he's as far away from God at the end as he was at the beginning. Now, the Apostle Paul puts that, you remember, in a memorable phrase in the first chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians, the world by wisdom knew not God. And not only didn't it know God, it couldn't teach itself how to live. Now, all the passing of these years establishes that. Indeed, we can go further. God has even proved by what he did through these long centuries that even to give his own law to mankind couldn't enable them to save themselves. Now the Apostle puts that we shall find in the 8th chapter of this epistle to the Romans in the 3rd verse. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin has condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. But here's the, 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 the nerve of the argument, the important point. What the law could not do. It was never meant to do it. But people believed it could. People said, give us a law, tell us how to live, and we'll live it and we'll put ourselves right. They're still saying that. Well, God gave them the law. And yet, you see, they couldn't keep it. The weakness of the flesh rendered them incapable of it. So the, the long passage of these centuries, in the case of the children of Israel, a special nation created by God, blessed by God, given the records by God, and the full revelation, still they couldn't keep it, and they wandered away from God. Their condemnation is established. The inability of men is absolutely proved. But finally, I think another reason is this that God perhaps did this in order to show his own lordship over all, to show his absolute control, to show his final authority. In other words, you take the Old Testament history and you'll find that it really comes to this. It can all be divided into two sections. God's actions and God's permissions. There are accounts here of the tremendous activity of God when he came in, as it were, and erupted onto the human scene and did things. The flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, crossing the Red Sea, entering into Canaan, the waters of the Jordan being divided and so on, the mighty actions of God. Ah, oh, yes, but there were long periods when God seemed to be doing nothing and permitted all sorts and kinds of things to happen, and people said, where is your God? And then God acted, and finally acted in the sending of his Son. So you see, the very delay, as it were, we shouldn't use the term, but from our human standpoint there isn't a better one, but this tremendous length of time between the fall and the coming of the Son has demonstrated and established all these things. I'm not at all sure in my own mind that finally the ultimate reason is this, that the devil should be silenced. Who is God's great antagonist? And who is always ready to say that God is dealing with mankind unfairly? I believe that the ultimate purpose of this long gap, this great interval, was that the mouth of the devil might be silenced. God has given mankind full opportunity to save itself, to put its world in order, to emancipate itself. He's blessed them in spite of their sin. He chose these people. He gave them a law. Still, nothing worked. And he allowed all these efforts and endeavors to be made, and they all came to nothing. 
the devil is silenced and God is just and there is not a word that can be said against him his ordering of the life of the world or of his great salvation. Very well, there is one of the themes that I felt was of necessity one that had to be taken up in the, in the light of this statement. But let us come to another. Why do you think the apostle insinuated this statement? You know, he, he always does this. I just uh, glanced at this in passing uh, last uh, Friday evening. Let me show it to you still more. Even you see here in the introduction, when he really is wanting to rush on to his big statement, which is the gospel of God concerning his son, whom he's going to describe. Ah, but even before he says that, he must say this, which he had promised aforetime by his servants, the prophets, in holy scriptures. Now, now, why did he do that? Why, why did he feel he must do it? And why did he always feel he must do it? Because he does the same thing in the third chapter, in the 21st verse. But now, he says, he's got his great argument here on justification by faith. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. You notice how he slips it in again? Witnessed unto, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You see, he does it everywhere. But the most interesting example of all, of course, is in the last verse but one in the whole epistle, uh, the 16th chapter of Romans, verse 26. I think this is most interesting. The apostle begins this letter and ends it almost in exactly the same way. Let me read these verses to you. We better start with verse 25. Here is his benediction. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. You see how he brings it in at the end? Starts with it, refers to it, ends with it. How anxious he seems to have been that these members of the church at Corinth should see the vital importance of this position of scripture in these matters. You may feel like saying to him, why doesn't he get on with it? Why doesn't he forget all about the Old Testament? Why will he keep on dragging in these prophets and these scriptures? What's, what's all this got to do? But the apostle, you see, keeps on doing it. Well, now, he not only does it here, of course. He does it uh, everywhere. You remember... We reminded one another last uh, Friday evening, I think at any rate we did so, that this was his customary method. Take, for instance, what you read in the 17th chapter of Acts, at the very beginning. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, there you are, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, what did he do? Reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. He didn't tell them stories. He didn't talk about himself and illustrate them with affecting stories. He didn't just conduct singing. He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. You see his method? The Scriptures, Old Testament, Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets, he took them and he reasoned with them out of them, proving and alleging, demonstrating his point. 
That was his method. And then you remember when he writes his first epistle to the Corinthians, there was trouble in that church at Corinth since the apostle had been there, there had been other teachers and so on. He writes a letter and in the 15th chapter he begins like this. First epistle, chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose the third day according to the Scriptures. Why will he keep on dragging that in? Why doesn't he forget about the Scriptures? Why not get on with the positive preaching, you may say? Why not tell us about Jesus Christ? Why keep on dragging in according to the Scriptures? But you see, he did. He always did it. And we saw last Friday evening how in writing to Timothy, in the second epistle and the third chapter and the 15th verse, he says that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, can make you wise unto salvation. Well, now then, the apostle, I say, keeps on doing the very thing that he does here at the very beginning of his letter. Why does he do it? Well, here are some of the reasons. He did it because he was anxious to prove to them that this gospel which he and others were preaching was not in one sense something new and strange, which was a complete departure from the past. That is the charge that was being brought against him. There were people who were saying, and especially the Jews, what's this new teaching? What's this new idea? What's this Jesus they're talking about? He wasn't a Pharisee. How could he therefore have been? And so on. Now, the apostle was anxious, I say, to show that this was not a departure from the past or a complete break with the Old Testament scriptures. His whole point was to show that it was indeed a continuation of what God had already been doing. That it was the same grand purpose of God which had started away back in the Garden of Eden and had been continuing right through the Old Testament times. It was just another act in the same series. Not something entirely different. A continuation, a fulfillment. And indeed, as we saw on our second Friday evening when we dealt with our analysis of this epistle, The Apostle's great argument in chapter 4 is that God is still using the same method that he always had used, namely faith. That God had never justified anybody on account of their works, always by faith. Abram was justified by faith, David was justified by faith and taught it in his 32nd Psalm, and God is still doing that, says Paul. The same God, the same purpose, the same salvation, the same method of salvation. So how important it is that we should know our Old Testament scriptures. Now that's one reason, but there's a second reason. It was at the Apostle's way, of course, of establishing the two main points in his preaching. Now there in that 17th chapter of Acts, in verse 3, we are really given the two points which this great preacher always made every time he preached. And his two points were these. Proving and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That was point number one. Point number two, that this Jesus which I preach unto you is the Christ. Now you see his points. The Jews had got an idea of the Messiah that he was going to be a great military and political personage who would come along and set up a great kingdom and found 
a great army, attack the Roman conquerors and destroy them, and become a great world ruler immediately. Their ideas were materialistic, mercenary. They thought purely in those terms in a nationalistic manner. And to them, the idea that this carpenter who was crucified in weakness could conceivably be the Messiah was unutterable nonsense. It was the stumbling block. Very well, the first thing the apostle had to do, therefore, when he preached to Jews was this, was to prove to them out of their own scriptures that the Messiah must need suffer that the Old Testament scriptures had always taught that the Messiah was going to be a suffering Messiah, a suffering servant, one who was going to be rejected and put to death. He must need suffer, be put to death, and rise again from the dead. If he couldn't establish that, how could he possibly convince them? So he began with that. And he took them through these scriptures, showing how the scriptures had prophesied that the Messiah was going to suffer in that way, suffer even death itself. And then, of course, having established that the scriptures taught that, the second step followed logically and inevitably. This Jesus whom we preach unto you is the Messiah. And then, you see, he did the thing which we were trying to do last Friday night. He showed all these detailed prophecies concerning him. And he said, well, now then, there's your evidence out of your own scriptures. But he couldn't have done that without the scriptures. That's why he keeps on bringing them in. Very well, therefore, we see that uh, his case can be put like this. As he puts it in the second epistle to the Corinthians, in the first chapter, verse 20, all the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen, to the glory of God the Father. Every single promise, in part and portion, in detail, or in a grand manner, it doesn't matter, all the promises of God in him are yea, are amen. Here's the fulfillment. Once and forever, it's all in this one person. He is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. And finally, I think the apostle did this for this reason. He had to do it in order to deal with another aspect of the Jewish problem, which gave him great concern, and rightly so. Take this tremendous argument which you find in chapters 9, 10, and 11 of this epistle to the Romans. What is it? Well, we can put it like this. Paul, in chapter 8, has been telling these Roman Christians about the marvelous promises of God, that they needn't worry, that there are all these great promises of God behind them and around them. And the moment he said that, somebody got up always and said this, oh, that doesn't help us very much because we read our Old Testament scriptures and we see there the marvelous promises that God gave to the Jews. But what of the Jews now? They don't seem to be much in evidence in your church. They seem to be outside and the Gentiles are crowding in. What are the promises of God to the Jews? Now, that's a problem that's got to be faced. And if the gospel can't answer that, it collapses. But the gospel can answer that. And in chapters 9, 10, and 11, the apostle simply, by going through the Old Testament scriptures, shows that the doctrine of the Old Testament scriptures is ultimately the doctrine of the remnant. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. There's a flesh, an Israel of the flesh, an Israel after the Spirit. He proves it from the Scriptures. So that what is happening, he says, far from being a denial of the Scriptures, is a fulfillment of the Scriptures. But of course, if he didn't know his Scriptures, if he didn't bring this in, he couldn't have done that. And it is still an essential part of the preaching of the Scriptures even today. And that is why it is so important that you and I should familiarize ourselves with these great arguments, 
and should be able to use them and to employ them. The apostle in his preaching used to take the people right through all this so that they could work it out and give answers when they went back to their homes and were tackled by their relatives for having become Christians. They could prove that they were in a scriptural position. Very well then, there we've dealt with two matters. Let me come to the final. The third great question that seems to me uh, to come out of this statement here in the second verse is this. That surely here then there are some very vital lessons for us. There are certain things which we must take a firm grasp of and never lose hold of. What are they? Well, here's the first. The Bible is complete. By taking verses 1 and 2 together, I prove it in this way. The argument of this second verse is that the Old Testament is the Word of God inspired that it was written by men who were moved by the Holy Ghost, his prophets, God's prophets. Not mere words of men, but revelation given to men who are then inspired to record it. That's your Old Testament. But already you remember in dealing with the term apostle, we saw in the first verse that the same applies to the New Testament writings. For they are either written by apostles or else can be traced directly to apostolic authority. Very well, then, we say that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have the complete revelation that God has given to men concerning these things. Which leads me to say this, that we must never add to this revelation And that is our Protestant answer to the Roman Catholic Church. Their whole position is, of course, that since the end of this canon, God has continued to speak uh, through those who are the successors of the apostles. To which we have already replied that there is no such thing as a successor to the apostle. By definition, it's impossible, because an apostle is one who must have seen the risen Lord. He must be one who has been commissioned and to whom this has been given. There is no successor to the apostle. Very well then. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. There's no addition to the foundation. That's laid once and forever. You build upon it. You never add to it. There is no fresh revelation. So that we do not worship the Virgin Mary. We do not believe in the Immaculate Conception. There's not a word about it here. The Roman Catholics agree about that, of course. Ah, they say this has been revealed since. We say there is no subsequent revelation. This is complete. Old Testament, New Testament, given by God. And it's all. There's nothing further. Everything, therefore, that claims to be revelation must be tested by this. So we reject the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. We reject the the doctrine, likewise, of the assumption and all these various other things which they claim, uh, for which they claim divine and unique authority. It is a violation of the scripture's teaching about itself. The Bible is complete. There can be no addition to this. It is here given. The Lord himself promised to the apostles that he would reveal further truth to them through the Holy Spirit. He did so. That's what we have in our epistles and so on. Here then is the complete revelation. But let me go on to a second point. The Bible therefore is authoritative. It's the only authority. It is our only rule and standard. And we must abide by its teaching in every respect. My message must always come from the Bible and from nowhere else. Further, my methods must also come from this. My whole activity in the things of God must be determined by the Bible. Message and method. And as I've already said, I must not believe anything unless it is either plainly stated in the scriptures or else can be legitimately deduced from the scriptures. And if neither of those applies, I must reject it. It is not a part of the truth of God. 
I have no authority but this, but this is my authority. And I must never go outside it. I must never try to add to it. I must never take from it. This, the whole Bible, is the revelation of God to men. It is the only authority. The next point, number three, is this one. The Bible is one. Though it consists of Old Testament and New Testament, it is only one book. I hate the idea that this is a library of books. Of course it isn't. It's one book. It's not even two books. The Old Testament and the New Testament are one. It's the same fundamental truth about the saving God and his grand purpose. Old and new are parts of the same thing. Point number four. The Old Testament is obviously, therefore, essential. We cannot dispense with the Old Testament because we are Christians and because we are living in what we call the New Testament dispensation. You know, there were certain heretics in the early church who thought they could. They said, of course, we don't need the Old Testament. That was the Jews' religion. That's a complete misunderstanding of it. That's absolutely false according to this teaching. We as Christians need the Old Testament today. It is as much needed as ever because of this unity and because of the things that are going to follow. So are we all quite happy about that? Do you read your Old Testament every year regularly as you do your New Testament? Do you go through your Old Testament at least once a year? You should. And how do you read your Old Testament? I find certain Christian people who only use their Old Testament, as they say, devotionally. They read the Psalms, and perhaps the prayer of an occasional man, or a bit of history. They use it devotionally. You have no right to use it devotionally only. There is revelation there, and we need its revelation. We must read it in the same way as we read the New Testament. We must realize that it's a part of the Revelation in exactly the same way. But I come now in my fifth point to something which is still more important. Our interpretation of the New Testament must never contradict the teaching of the Old Testament. Now that is really serious. This tendency to put a wedge between the two has often led to that. Let me repeat my principle. We must never interpret the New Testament in such a way or manner as to bring it into contradiction with the Old Testament. Let me take one example, the most important of all. Take the doctrine of the atonement, the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now you will find that it's very popular today to say, oh, of course, you can't define the atonement. You can't define the death of our Lord. And of course, this idea of substitution and of punishment. We as Christians can't accept that. As Christians, of course, we know that God is a God of love and that these ideas of justice and so on are quite remote. Of course, you get that sort of thing in the Old Testament, but we remember that the, the Old Testament is the Old Testament, and it was the Jews' religion, and they hadn't come to this full light. Uh, the full revelation of God and his love in Christ had not yet been given. Uh, so we say to them, well, what you say the cross is about, what is your idea? Well, they say, it's just this. It's God even forgiving the cruelty of men that put his own son to death on the cross. That's what it is. Nothing else. God wasn't doing anything there. It's God forgiving Calvary. God forgiving the cruelty and the malignity of these blind people who didn't recognize his own son. The son forgave them and the father forgave them. They say that's the teaching, the meaning of the death and the cross. But I'm here to assert that on the basis of what the apostle says here about the Old Testament that that's a lie. It's not true. It's an interpretation of the death which denies the teaching of the Old Testament. The Old Testament teaching is teaching about sacrifice. 
An offering has got to be made. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It was God who was putting his son to death. It was God who made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It was God who, by striping, punishing him, was dealing with our sins, that he might forgive us, that he might be just, as we shall see in chapter 3, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. The whole teaching of the Old Testament is expiation, punishment of sin, that a holy God must, that blood must be shed, that a sacrifice and an offering must be presented. And if I interpret the death in the New Testament apart from those terms of sacrifice and expiation, my interpretation is wrong. You see the importance of holding on to your Old Testament? I delivered unto you first of all, says the Apostle, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Not this sentimental view of his death, but according to the Scriptures. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. The great antitype to which all the types have been pointing. Here it is. Hold on to your Old Testament, my friend. And beware lest you interpret the new at any point or in any respect in a manner that doesn't show that the new is the fulfillment of the old. Very well, I'll put that as my next point, number six. The New Testament does fulfill the Old Testament. Here is a very important practical point again. If you don't remember that, your view of salvation may very well be a false one. You know, there are some false views of salvation. There are people today who seem to teach and to believe that you can take Christ as your Savior without taking him as your Lord. They say you can take justification without taking sanctification. They say you can get forgiveness of sins without holiness. It's a lie. The apostle puts it like this at the end of the third chapter of this epistle to the Romans. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. And if your view of salvation is one that seems to you to say that the law you needn't worry about any longer, that you can live as you like as long as you believe in Christ, that it's just forgiveness, you've never understood it. Salvation is something that fulfills the law. It doesn't avoid the law, it fulfills it. And I've already quoted Romans 8 to you. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Listen to Paul saying it in another place. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, you can't receive him except as the Lord. You can't take him as your Savior and say, I'll later perhaps take him as my Lord. He's always the Lord, and you receive him as Lord. The new is the fulfillment of the old. And the same thing I feel often applies to the whole question of rebirth. There are people who seem to think that the Old Testament saints were not born again. But it's thoroughly unscriptural to say that. They were. We as Christians are Abraham's seed. We are children of Abraham and children of faith. And the kingdom into which we have entered is the old kingdom in which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been for so long. You see the importance of realizing that the New Testament is the fulfillment of the old. The other thing it reminds us of is this. This is my seventh point. If you keep your eye on the Old Testament always, you will remember that there is a world purpose in salvation. Salvation is personal, thank God, but it's much more. God has got a purpose for the whole world, and you'll see it in chapter 11 of this epistle to the Romans. The fullness of the Gentiles, all Israel, the complete plan. Never lose sight of that. The Old Testament emphasizes that. 
because it gives you a picture in its first 11 chapters of Genesis of the world at large before God had separated this one nation. The world view, the Old Testament always emphasizes it. There are other things which I'll merely give you the headings of this evening because our time is gone, I regret to say. But the importance of keeping your eye on the Old Testament emerges here in the whole question of evangelism and revivals and the relationship between the two. If you keep your eye on the Old Testament, you can never have a subjective evangelism, by which I mean this, that the business of evangelism is not just to solve people's problems. Psychology does that, the cults do that, many things do that. The thing that separates this from every other teaching is this, that it is primarily a proclamation of God and your relationship to God. Not your particular problems, but the problem that is common to all of us, that we are condemned sinners before a holy God and a holy law. That's evangelism. It must, therefore, always put repentance first. Now, the Old Testament constantly reminds us of that. You can't get away from it. But also, it does this. It shows us, I say very clearly, that God's way of keeping his cause and his truth alive is the way of revival. You work through your Old Testament, and this is what you'll find. There were those dead, lifeless periods, and you'd think that everything had come to an end. How did they suddenly give way to something else? Was it that people got together and organized something? Never. Never. Not a single occasion. Invariably, it happens like this, that when they were all utterly hopeless and downcast, and really thought the end had come, God suddenly, unexpectedly, and in a most amazing manner, did something. It's God who revives his work. You see, you and I tend to be anxious, over-anxious about the ark, don't we? And like that poor man, Uzzah, we put our hand to steady it, and he was struck dead for attempting to do so. And there are many people today who seem to think that they've got to do something to safeguard God's cause. My dear friend, you needn't trouble. God revives his work. But in his time, in his way, and with the person whom he's chosen. The old, the old Testament history is most amazing in that respect. So that finally I come to this. There is nothing more comforting and more encouraging to the Christian than to be familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. Paul, you see, puts it like this in this very epistle in chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Is there anybody depressed and discouraged in this congregation? Go back to your Old Testament Scriptures. Read them, study them, learn them by heart, see God's method. There is nothing that so encourages us and teaches us to exercise patience as the Old Testament does. The whole of the 11th of Hebrews is used in that way, you remember. So that my very last point is this. You and I must learn to submit ourselves utterly and absolutely to God's ways and never question them. I'm a preacher, says Paul, of wonderful good news. Ah, oh, yes, but God had said in a foretime that it was going to happen and going to come. But all the centuries passed and nothing seemed to happen. What's the lesson? The lesson is this. Put yourself and everything that is of concern to you entirely in the hands of God. His ways are strange. You remember he tells us through Isaiah that he says, My ways are not your ways, nor your thoughts my thoughts. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours, as the heavens are higher than the earth. Put your case into his hands. Is it a personal problem in your life? Leave it there. 
Are you worrying about the conversion of some dear one you've been praying for years and nothing seems to happen and you're on the point of giving up and you say, what's the use? If you feel like that, go back to the Old Testament and realize that after God gave the promise about the seed of the woman in the Garden of Eden, that 4,000 long years passed before the seed of the woman actually came and was born by a babe in Bethlehem. That's God's method. Don't give up. These are God's ways. I don't understand them. But that's the teaching of the Old Testament. That's what I deduce from this little verse in brackets. Or are you troubled about the state of the church? The dwindling congregations, the opposition of the world, the might of the world, the organization of the world, and all these things. Oh, I say, go back and get hold of the comfort and the consolations of the Scriptures. Or are you troubled by something that's happening in the world today? Well, put it in the context of the Old Testament. I was never worried for a second about a man like Hitler. It was enough for me to read the 37th Psalm. And there I read of a man like him, spreading himself like a green bay tree, and a sort of colossus striding the whole earth. But I read that a day come when a man went to go and see him and speak to him and couldn't find him. He searched everywhere for him, for him but couldn't find a trace of him. He'd vanished. Why, God had blown upon him. And the Old Testament is full of that sort of thing. Very well, then, in the light of all this, what can we say? I have nothing to say but this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He seems to go to sleep for centuries, but he's still there. His ways are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed to him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom and to whom alone be glory forever. Amen. Which he had promised aforetime by his servants, the prophets, in Holy Scriptures. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we pray thee to make these things living and real and true to us. Forgive us, we pray thee again, for our neglect of thy word and for our failure to realize their message. Forgive us, O God, that we are ever depressed or downcast or fearful or apprehensive or crushed by some care. O Lord, teach us to use the scripture which thou hast given to us for our comfort and consolation for our edification and establishment in the faith. O Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding and manifest thyself unto us more and more. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this our short and certain life and earthly pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.